The Central District Board of Health meeting for Friday, May 20th. Uh, it is 10 15 a.m. Uh, I will call the meeting to order, um, introducing myself as presiding chair. I am uh, Betty Ann Nettleton, representing Elmore County, along with uh, Representative Megan Blanksma. Um, we'll go ahead and take roll call by county, starting with Jane Young. Uh, Jane Young, Ada County. Raul Labrador. Raul Labrador here. Dr. Cole, Boise County, Elmore County, uh, Valley County. Mr. Hasbrook here. Thank you all. Okay, we do have a quorum present, so we will proceed with action items. Uh, Director Duke, are there any changes to the agenda? Madam Chair, there is. It's an information item, and I just wanted to update the board on the upcoming staff changes. Maybe we could do that. Before or after, after the minutes? After the minutes? Yeah. After the minutes, okay. So All Madam, right. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion we amend the agenda to include that discussion. Okay, thank you, Al. The motion's been made to hear a second. Second. Thank you, Jane. Any further discussion? Call, hearing none, I'll call for a vote to, uh, by County, Jane Young. Aye. Around Labrador. Aye. Uh, Boise County, that's <coughs> Valley County. Uh, Valley County, aye. Right. Okay, and Elmer County, aye. Right. The motion does pass. So we we'll proceed with um, under new business. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We have in person public comments. Do we have anybody sign up today? Did not, did not have anybody sign up for a public comment. Okay, uh, next on our agenda is uh, our motion for approval of our April 15th board meeting uh, minutes. Uh, is there any corrections or additions to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, I will ask for a motion for approval. So moved. I'll second. Okay, uh, call for a, a vote by county starting with Dr. Young. Aye. Raul Labrador. Aye. Um, down to Valley County. Mr. Hasbrook, aye. And Elmore County votes aye. Elmore County votes aye. Okay, those motions, those minutes have been approved as presented. Um, Staff changes. Pardon? Staff changes. Staff changes. You're on. All right. You're on. So I just wanted to let the, the board know that uh, Gina Pinnell is going to be leaving us as Division Administrator of Family and Clinic Services on. June 22nd will be her last day, uh, just briefly. She has quite an extensive uh, list of successes for CDH, but I'll just share a couple with you real quick. Uh, her and I have worked together for about seven years. Uh, she came to us as the Region 4 SHIP. It was a statewide healthcare innovation plan grant that some of you may remember. It was a four-year grant that came to Idaho and she managed that for Central District Health and built partnerships with the broader community around healthcare and integrating public health with healthcare. Uh, one of the, the successes from that that's longer lasting is the Western Idaho Community Health Collaborative was born out of those regional collaboratives that she oversaw. And then uh, she started working as a part-time project manager. Uh, again, lots of successes. The two that I would call out was uh, she was the architect behind a uh, legislative idea, which was called Plan First Idaho. And that was to provide access for women of reproductive age to Medicaid benefits for reproductive health services prior to pregnancy. So this is ahead of Medicaid expansion that actually happened later that fall. Uh, we did get a bill through the house and then it got held on the floor. Uh, and the, the whole idea was uh, our state would pay for a woman's care and delivery and postpartum for up to two months after she became pregnant, but could not get access to those services prior to becoming pregnant. So that to me was a really big deal. And had Medicaid not uh, been expanded, we would, we would have expected that we could have got that through the Idaho legislature the following year. So 
Sorry about the lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> it's small town, you know. Yeah, yeah right. Um, and then the, the second thing that was really significant, and again, the impact has been long lasting, was she did all the research, put together all the uh, justifications for having a uh, state general fund cover home visiting programs. As you know, we now have parents as teachers that's funded by the state, uh, as well as being paid for or reimbursed by Medicaid for Medicaid families that we serve. And that's to me is a really big deal. And now we're with the board's support expanding home visiting to include nurse family partnership. And then we also have an infant early childhood mental health uh, program. And again, I know we have other agenda items. So she moved out of, out of basically that role uh, as COVID came online on March 13th, first case, Meridian, Idaho, and built an amazing relationship with our school. So I, I remember the superintendents when she moved out of that role, moving into manage our, our clinic. I got quite a few uh, calls and conversations about um, don't let her go. And it's like, well, she's actually kind of moving up. But uh, <laughs> so that was pretty impressive. And I think, you know, a compliment to Gina for sure. And then uh, she did the clinic manager role for a year and then moved into the division administrator role a little less than a year ago. And, and it's certainly been challenging, right? Because all business has been disrupted by COVID and, and our staff as well, because they they were asked to help with the response. So bringing that uh, group and team, I, I say back online with, with doing what we had always done prior to COVID. And so, I can't thank her enough for her, her time and the partnership that we've we've shared at CDH, and we'll certainly miss her. Well, and I think too, correct me if I'm wrong, but she's really instrumental too in setting up the mental health boards. Oof, what five years, six years ago? I don't know how long it's been. Yeah, I had some a summer one. Though. Some of that too, and and it's it's so neat to see how you, this you guys got. We have such great staff. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to take on these big projects because some people that just scares the bananas out of them and they don't like to do it and it's fun to see people step up and make it work miss you you know yes thank you gina success and joy to you okay um, do we know where she's where she... did you want to say a few words or anything before i no, i'm okay i, I don't have anything lined up right now She's going to come back and take over the family ranch. <laughs> okay. Well, moving on with the agenda, uh, Laurel, we need a review of our support um, of our financial Should situation. Should here or sit at the... That's I've... fine. Okay. Don't be there. I will be able to see you. We can see right. you. We're a little better. Thank you. And are we appreciating? Okay, great. <laughs> That's a little bit of guidance. All right, so we will start with the budget to actual report this morning. And just as a spoiler alert, no big changes from what we've seen throughout the fiscal year so far, as you probably recognize. Um, so this Report includes numbers through the end of April, which is 83% of the way through the fiscal year. Um, our revenues, as they have been, are above our budgeted amount, and our expenditures continue to be a little bit below our budgeted amount. That's the, the overall summary, looking at it in a little bit more detail. Um, our fees are high compared to budget in both, um, or in the Community Environmental Health Division, and slightly under in FCS. Um, and again, that's the trend that we've seen throughout the year. Um, our other revenue is above budget at this time for support services and FCS. Um, and for FCS, that includes the state home visitation funds. CEH there is a little bit lower than we planned for this time of the year um, at 68% of budget. Um, and that is due to a different amount than planned in our WHC funding. So that is coming in a little bit lower than where we thought we'd be at this point in the year. If we look at expenditures down below in the second part of this report, um, you can see that we're at 77% total, and that's 5% behind where we predicted we'd be at this time of the year. 
Personnel is at about 74% of budget. So that one's a little bit more significantly behind, about 10% behind where we thought we'd be. Um, same, same reasons as last time. That's some salary savings. We've had some position vacancy. And then um, at the beginning of this year, we had some of our positions, especially in support services and administration, still charging to the COVID grants um, rather than that going into the, the district funded costs. And Madam Chair, question? Yes, go ahead. Um, Laura, do you think we're going to go over on fees on the community environmental? Because they're at 94 percent, 95 percent. It looks like um, we may go over. Do you anticipate that? I would anticipate yes, that we will go somewhat over, and that's um, that we're getting in more fees than we plan to due to growth in community mm -hmm. environmental health. So, not a bad thing to be over there. Well, I think what I'm trying to get at is if we're in a, we have a department that's actually making more than we anticipated, maybe we need to think more about throwing more salary at those positions that you're having in the lands. I mean, this, this kind of sells it to me. And we had, you know, with the discussion we had at our commissioners last week, we need to get more help for community environmental health because we're just too short staffed there. And I think we're going to run Mike into the ground. So I think we need to think about doing something here pretty quick for those positions to see if we can't lure somebody back, unless you have an update on any applicants. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Russ. Um, so we, we, I don't have an update where, you know, obviously Commissioner Hasbrook's talking specifically about Valley County, and because it's such a relatively low population, very rural community, it's hard to find somebody with this expertise. And then, of course, the wages we have to pay for that position are, uh, you know, you could say it used to be Valley County was somewhat isolated in that regard as a resort community, but it's pretty clear to everyone now that it's our entire district, including the county we're sitting in right now. So we did do the salary assessment, which I shared with the board mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a salary plan which has been approved by the budget that the budget committee just approved but i do want to continue talking about salaries you know we do salaries this time of year this is the annual um, compensation plan but I, i'm going to bring some ideas back in august for consideration of the board, not necessarily to be implemented then, but I, we're going to have to continue to have these conversations because uh, it's becoming less and less affordable, more difficult to retain staff, which you're well aware of. And then recruitment uh, is incredibly difficult. And unlike, unlike Elmore County, where Brent uh, drives from Boise every day, and it's not that big of a deal, it's two and a half hour windshield time to get up to the north end of Valley County. So five hours a day, so we're paying hotels and mm -hmm. that's not the lifestyle individuals want. So I think for now, I think I, I'm glad you brought that up, but um, and then on the fee revenue side, if the economy starts heading in the, the other direction, mm -hmm. then you, you are end up with less revenue than we budgeted because some of those things you don't, I mean, you can kind of anticipate, but you can't precisely anticipate how that'll turn out. So I, but I, I always hesitate to, you know, let's do it for that one position because it's always that ripple effect throughout the organization. I know, and it's hard to do, but I'll tell you, some of the biggest calls you get as commissioners is the first one is always roads. The second one is I'm waiting for a billing inspector, and the third one is a sewer a septic inspector. It's been yeah. two weeks or three, weeks, whatever the issue is, and you get those calls. Those people call, right? And you're absolutely right as far as, you know, I think we're going to see a slowdown here in the building up there, but um, we're starting to refund some building permits because the costs are just too high right now. Yeah. But it it slows down, but it never goes back to where it used to be. It's mm -hmm. always a different level all the way up. Right. And I hope we can seriously can reconsider this because it's going to be pain in my tuchus. People can't get inspected. <laughs> Understood. Absolutely. <laughs> love. <laughs> okay, sorry, Laura, I didn't mean to get us clear off in the weeds, but we did. Okay, well, we are you ready to move on to page two, actually? I got that up on the screen. So, page two, um, and as a reminder, which I always do, this just compares of where we are now to where we are were at the last um, two fiscal years at this point in the year. 
Um, so you can see these are higher than they've been at this point over the last couple of years, actually 20,000 above uh, where we were this time last year for both FCS and CEH, so that's great. Um, and looking at a little more detail there, uh, sewage fees are down, but land and food programs have seen big increases in community environmental health. Um, and that's exactly what we'd expect to see with the growth that we're seeing in the counties. Um, in family and clinic services, our increases are in central care, child dental clinic, home visitation. Um, and then we have that increase in the COVID immunization insurance, which we're calling out separately. Um, and then down in immunizations and reproductive health. Contracts. Um, also, same trend as we've seen throughout the year, a significant increase over where we were at FY20. We've got the, the COVID funds in FY21, and we're just a little bit behind um, where we were for contracts this time last year and continuing to spend some of those COVID funds that we got last year. Um, and then if you look at the right column of this page, you see the same that we just went over for personnel and operating costs. Um, personnel costs are under a planned amount. Um, operating is about 6% above our budgeted amount. And then for capital outlay, you can see again here represented a different way, the same thing from um, page one, about 91% or about 9% above where we budgeted to be. And that has to do with, um, we had designated some carryover funds last year for, for special projects. We're starting to use some of those funds. So it's being represented here as looking like we're slightly above budget, but it's within what we plan to do with those carryover funds. And then moving on to the cash balance statement. Um, and this is the page I'm most excited to talk about because we have some updates on our special projects that um, you set aside funds for um, in August of last year. But to go over the this high level view of this page, this report shows our total cash balance at 8 million. Um, when we deduct our reserve fund designation balances from the total cash balance, that gives us that undesignated cash balance of uh, about 2.5 million. And that's what we've expected to see based on the trends that have been happening that did come down slightly from last month. Um, but the center part of this page is where we have our special projects and carryover designation called out um, for the, the top line item there. Uh, furniture order has been finalized. So for that completion of Boise office remodel, um, we need to place that order, the final order, um, by the end of this week or early next week, and it has to be done before the end of this month uh, to, to get that pricing guarantee that we've locked in. So we're excited to see that furniture come in, be installed, and finally finish up that remodel that has been put off based on not having space in the building. So that's exciting for all of us <laughs> that are working there all the time. Um, the IT costs that you can see has gone up since last month. Um, the biggest project that came out of that was our transition to Office 365, and then there have been some other IT security projects and updating um, old equipment that wasn't functioning for us that's coming out of that as well. So starting to see that coming in. Um, our facility and maintenance service projects, uh, part of the, the our capital projects, you can see we've spent not, not quite half of what we planned to there. Um, don't anticipate that we'll spend all of that this year, but we do have um, the McCall roof project underway um, and a few other things that, that we really wanted to get done that are happening and included in that. Um, the FCS marketing campaign, uh, we still just paid for the initial contractor there, but we are getting close to having a contract in place for um, our internet redesign uh, for the FCS site to draw more visitors to the site and have an easier look and feel and be much more user friendly. So that is in the works and getting close to completion. Um, our facility modernization costs are totally spent. Um, so that project is, is complete, what we set aside money for there. Um, and then our positions that we designated through the carryover designations, the grant writer, and the halftime admin assistant for health policy and promotion. Um, those both had, were a little bit slower getting going than we hoped. Um, and we did have a short vacancy in the grant writer position, but we have a great grant writer on the team now. So both of those positions, uh, we're starting to see some funds come out of them, but again, not what we anticipated they would be. And then NFP program is still getting off the ground, starting to see very <laughs> few funds come out of that, but um, Gina's developed a, a great plan to get that in motion and going, and um, we'll continue to see that drawdown. Madam Chair, two questions. First of all, um, on the webpage redesign, do you guys RFP that out, or is mm -hmm. that in, all done in? Okay. Yep. 
And what are those coming in? Have you got any bids yet? I don't actually know the answer to that, but I can find out and let you know. I think it's the, can I, sure. can I update? So I think the RFP is in the final stages of being developed. I don't know if there's oh, yeah, gone out yet. Okay. Out. Yeah, no one's gone out to bid yet. Those can be really, a week. really, really tricky. What we're yeah. learning at the county is just we've got to do better RFPs in order to get the exact product we want. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're doing those. Um, the other one on the nurse family partnership, is that just because we can't get nurses hired? I'm not sure. Go ahead, Bill. Yes. So uh, Gina and team, um, along with Gary Foote, our HR manager, have been recruiting and recruiting, and that kind of continues to play out because you, you, the board actually approved the budget initially back in de December, formally in January. And Gina, we have a we have a manager, right, who is hired but not yet started. And I, we don't have any of the other positions filled yet, right? So you you had suggested it's gonna be difficult yeah. to fill yeah, because we, of it being a medical position. This labor issue is gonna get worse and worse, I think, for all of us. Um, and to me, it seems like if I'm a nurse and I've been going through the coronavirus stuff for the last two or three years, I'd want to maybe pull back and do a job that's a little easier. So I don't know, maybe if it's how we're advertising for that position or what, I don't know, but uh, and maybe a sign-up bonus or something that we need to talk about to, to get these positions filled. Because um, I think what this is going to happen is this is all, it's starting to hit all at once. I mean, it's not us, it's Forest Service, state agencies, it's all over. And uh, it's going to be a challenge to fill on. Uh, it's a concerning issue. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I interrupted again. Sorry. Good okay. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that, that summarizes the budget to actual report and cash balance statement. So, okay. ready to move on to fees? If uh, yes, or please do, Laurel. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, this is the proposed FY23 uh, FCS and environmental health fee schedules. Um, with board approval, these will be effective July 1st of this year. Um, to start off with, I'd like to do a quick review of the fee development process. Um, so first of all, we adhere to state statutes and rules and any relevant program requirements, um, federal program rules in particular. In setting the fees, uh, the division administrators, program staff, um, and Bailey meet to go over what the actual costs were, what we anticipate would cost growth. Um, we also look at the current, uh, the reasonableness of fees, comparison to other fees imposed by similar entities. We look at standard reimbursement amounts by three parties, and we also consider clients' ability to pay. So all of those things are considered, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the process that we use for FCS fees, but that's kind of our starting point. Um, in FCS, in about 2018, we transitioned from cost-based assessment to the national standard. Um, we used the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, they established position fee schedules, and they update and review that annually. Um, and then our CPT codes have a relative value unit assigned. Um, that defines the value of a service or procedure relative to all procedures and services. Um, so we take all that in, into consideration, and then we use, so CDH uses the non-facility total RVU um, by that, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid for Idaho, and then we multiply it by a conversion factor. So that's how we get to the fees for FCS. Um, our conversion factor mirrors the premium conversion factors listed uh, by Blue, Blue Cross of Idaho Provider Agreement. Um, so that's... Again, just a little bit of background on there. If there's no conversion factor, we use 200% of Idaho Medicaid's fee schedule, and if neither exists, then we use actual costs, the history of fees, and adjust as needed. So um, the handout here lists our proposed fees. We're starting with FCS. Um, several of the fees, at least starting with, you can see, remain the same, but many of our fees did go, did go up this year. We're proposing that they go up, um, and that's based on the changes in those RVUs, actual cost, um, and what we're seeing in other with other providers too. So look at any of those that you need to in detail. Most of the increases are um, anywhere from 
five to twenty dollars. There are a few on here that you'll see that are more than that, um, and those are just based on those rates we discussed. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, no, go ahead. Laurel, because um, I don't understand this part of it. So these new fees are still going to be covered under the Medicare dollars. I mean, we're still going to be okay that way. Mm -hmm. So these are like their new rates? So, and Gina may, um, may need to <laughs> explain some of this more. So these are the fees that we have posted and we are, we do bill insurance first and then we have the sliding fee available for clients who don't have insurance um, based on their, their financial situation. So those things are all taken into consideration. Right, right. These are posted, posted fees for the services. Jane, what's our conversion package? 67.15. That's from Blue Cross. <laughs> and that was set in 2020. We haven't seen any updates to that since then. I have another question. Yes, go ahead. How do you go for the next one, Ron? I don't know. To make that possible because this wouldn't come. Up. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple. Madam Chair. Yes. <laughs> we have a uh, discount rate that we get the next one for, and then we also slide the well, so we can slide the device to the device as well as the application fee. So it really is dependent. It's mostly Title Ten clients that come to us, and so it's income dependent. They meet income qualifications from zero. zero I'm going to up against 100%. So if you need more details, just look at their billing coordinator to kind of get the, the background information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Lauren. Okay. Um, we will move on then to the environmental health fees. Um, and you'll see the same thing here. Most of the fees um, are increasing this year. Um, and those are based on the actual costs um, for the services that we provided last year and based on the fact that we do anticipate those costs will, will continue to go up. Um, there are some here that are set by rule or statute and those we have um, an asterisk by just to let you know that's the single asterisk there. And so most of those ones are staying the same um, unless rule or statute dictated that we increased and then the other increases are just based on the actual cost of the services themselves. Oh, Laurel, if I may, uh, are you getting a lot of pushback uh, from on the sewage program permits? Um, Madam Chair, I'm not sure. Madam yes. Chair? Yes, go ahead. No. No. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair, answer. if I might comment on that, I think it, the secret to that is, is the installers and talking to those guys and letting people know that this is how we're doing it. It's just our cost. We're not making money off of this. Right. And yeah. it changes everybody's perspective, yeah. attitude on that. They realize that. Right. Um, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if I mind. On the planning and zoning reviews, can you kind of tell me what the difference is between a, an office review that would be if, if Valley County sent you a, a land development application that was going to require septic or I mean where does the subdivisions per lot cost all that stuff come in on this do you know oh, I just have not found it I also don't know the answer to that question but I may be able to refer it to, to Jamie no I'm sure I have to just I'll get that from my email with the information the okay is, okay well I, I can do that I can call Mike okay. and talk to him okay. again about it because of some of the things we're looking at up there is all of our PNZ application fees and all that stuff. We're going through that process as well and mm -hmm. PD applications, that kind of stuff, because we had overwhelming development. So trying to relook at it. And people don't like it, but it is what it is. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, if I'm happy to answer any other questions or <laughs> at least <laughs> Take note of questions and get back to you if you have any that I can't answer. Um, but if there are no other questions on the fees, then we will need a board motion to approve uh, the FY22 fee schedule. I would, I would be interested too, Laurel, if we can uh, share Mike's Mike's response, and Jamie, uh, as in regards to Elle's question too. Yes, definitely. On this uh, planning and zoning review sewage issue. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Okay, having heard uh, Laurel's report, we do need a motion for approval for the fee structure. Madam Chair, before we continue on, I guess there's one more thing I'd like to discuss, and I don't just want to throw it out here, and that's the child care inspections. As everybody knows, there's a huge shortage of daycares in Idaho, and I'm just wondering if it would behoove us to maybe to encourage more development to drop some of those fees. We may have to subsidize it from somewhere else in the budget, but the ones that are uh, seven to 12 children are probably the most popular ones in our area. Um, I know there's a lot of other rates that kick in, but I don't, I don't know them exactly, but if you get above a certain amount of kids, you gotta have two people, and that's where the costs really start racking up. Uh, right now, child care in Valley County is averaging about 550 a child per month. And uh, it's that's five days a week. And that's pretty tough. People should be able to make some money doing it, but I'm just thinking about maybe we could we could have those fees for now to see if we can encourage any more child care establishments. Just throwing it out there. Madam Chair, yes, go ahead. Um, those are fees that are set by ruler statute, so they would take more than. Oh, oh really? By yeah. the legislature? Okay, so that's um, that's yes. really good to know because yeah. I get asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Laurel. Okay, uh, do I hear a motion for approval? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the fees for fiscal year 2023. Okay, thank you, Jane. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Uh, any further discussion before we move on for a vote? Okay, hearing then. Ada County? Jane? Jane aye. Raul Labrador? Aye. Uh, Boise County, Elmore County are absent. Valley County? Valley County, aye. Okay, Elmore County, uh, Nelson, aye. Okay, those fees help them approve. Okay, um, we're moving right along here. Number four, I'm going to um, ask Director Duke to uh, lead this discussion. Okay. This is a review on community guidance for masking in schools. So I just by way of background the at the April 25th board meeting, the board had approved a policy where when CDH pushes information out to our communities around COVID that would impact children, children being under the age of 18, that we would present that to the board for consideration before we would do that in the case of, in some instances, we already have information out there like on masking and vaccines. So at that meeting, when that policy was approved, the board had specifically noted two, two items, two topics that you wanted to have our team do the research and then present to you what basically what our findings and recommendations would be around again those two specific topics so uh, the first is is masking on the agenda and i thought we'd address it you know there are two separate topics we'd address them separately but i wanted to also uh, give a little bit of background so i provided you with the documents that our team put together there i would call them white papers that are pretty concise well-referenced um, and just to understand there's a lot of information out there right there's information on the internet there's information in various um, I call them enter entertainment uh, journals versus science journals so uh, we referenced the journals that we feel like are have really good reputations, are uh, well respected in the community, and we talk in the community in the United States. So I, I did give you a handout, it's a pretty brief page and a quarter about the difference between what peer reviewed is versus what I just described. So we used what are commonly known as peer reviewed journals. So, uh, so uh, on, on, masking 
I would say the literature out there, again, it's, it's not that people don't question it or have differences of opinion, but there is evidence to show that masking in general in crowded public spaces, including schools, during high transmission does reduce uh, the infections of COVID-19. So I, I can talk about that document I provided you. I know um, Donna had included it in your board packet. So really, I guess it comes down to the, then the policy question because with masking, it's not like the next topic, which is vaccines where, well, we'll get to that, but that is, to me, masking is something that was done and, and certainly, I guess the policy part for the board is to determine, is that something that you would essentially want us to say, stay silent on because CDC recommends masking in schools today and with with the kind of the qualifier of what are the transmission rates in the community and we're we're they're starting to creep up but they're still pretty low the impact of the hospitals is quite low uh, so my thought on it is you know it, it it does work from what we were able to find and then you all have to decide do you want us to what I believe it was, was not to not recommend it, but rather remain silent on the subject. So just, I wanted to make that a point of clarity. If it were to not recommend, then that's like we would say, we recommend that you don't wear a mask or the next topic we recommend you don't get vaccines and that's different. But my understanding was we just remain silent on it, not recommend uh, this to childcare and schools. So that- Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. That's, that's the way I looked at it is not recommending, letting people make decisions based on the available information out there. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't, rec people can do what <laughs> I, I believe in freedom that pe people choose. If you choose to wear one, if you think it helps, but but I think the data is negligible at best uh, on, on the effects. But I think the moment that we recommend it, I have heard from many schools that, that that recommendation is seen as we have to do it or we're going to get in trouble. And, and I think we just remain silent on, on it and let, let people decide, let the parents decide what they want to do for their kids and let the school districts decide and not use, which they have used many times, the CD, CDH recommendation as a crutch for their decision. If the school wants to make that decision, then or the school district, then that's their, then they, they can make that without using CDH as, as the, the crutch for that. That would be my my recommendation, I guess. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes, um, go ahead. I think it's really important to go back and look at our history on this because when coronavirus first came out in 19 and 20, nobody really knew how bad it was gonna be. Correct. And so we all kind of maybe overreacted a little bit. To my feeling is I think we need, and the reason why we did the mask was to slow it down. It wasn't to end the disease, but it was to slow it down so the hospitals could keep up. Mm -hmm. And we came close, I think, mm -hmm. twice. Yes. But I think we've gotten through it now to where everybody's been very well educated and they can, they can claim any kind of thing they want, one side or the other of the argument. But I think we just need to watch what happens in the hospitals. And then... If it gets bad again, like it did in 19 and 20, then, we, then we're then we gonna have to meet again, and discuss it, making it more more strong, stronger. Um, yes, that's kind of my feeling too, and, and you know, to Ronald's point and to yours too, El, um, that we watch over the summer months what's happening with this new variant, and if we need to address it in our August meeting, we can. Great. So, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. Yes. So for now, the, you know, we're basically aligning our recommendations with CDC, or when we say ours, there's really not much communication with schools anymore. Things are, you know, kids are graduating, COVID rates in our community are quite low. Is it the board's preference that we remove references to masking 
during certain transmission levels, because that's what CDC is saying, especially if you have high transmission, you should consider. And we say, well, we agree with that. So just to be clear, should we then remove those references to masking basically from our website and any communication we have with schools and childcare, I can't think of other scenarios, and then come back to you with things, if things got really bad, like if, for example, children started to be impacted in a really negative way, being hospitalized. Uh, I just want to be clear so I, we know how to direct our staff. Is that the preference of the board as we, yes. we kind of pull back from any masking references and suggestions, and then you guys can make a motion on it. That's what it is and vote. Correct. So, Jane? Madam Chair, so you're saying not have any information on the website for people that don't begin to understand CDC or all these other articles? Do I'm not, not recommending have, that. I'm is saying that what you're, what you're saying might happen? Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. So, Dr. Young, for just, I'm, I'm just putting that, I just want to be clear, like what, what you guys just discussed, I want you to make it, make a decision because it's an action item. I, I want to make sure I understand what the board's preference is based on motion and vote. Right. You, I, I just need to be clear, you not, a, we're supporting CDC's recommendations today, which is to have students mask in schools and especially when you're in high transmission which we are not would you want us to remove those references from our website and from our conversations with schools and child care and other businesses that serve children so again it's a recommendation that you should mask especially in crowded areas indoors and especially during high transmission that's what we're saying today Madam Chair, this, yeah, um, go ahead, yeah. I think we need to kind of preference these. I hate to really take them off all of our advice yeah. when people get on our website. They want to know what what should I really do if I go to a sports event or a concert or an indoor event. Here's the recommendations if you're going to do that. But I think we need to preface it with if we reach another 5% or a 10% or whatever number infection rate, we have a big outbreak of it again. Then, then we need to go back and notify the public again that this is this is our recommendations for that. But right now, I think it's it should stay on there as advice to people. Right. But we're not advising you to do it but, now, Madam Chair. That's not what the motion was said at the last meeting. And, <clears throat> and the reality is that the recommend that people don't understand recommendation versus everything else. And and when we recommend these entities that are making policy, that are making policy for their schools and all these things, the moment that we recommend something, they don't see a difference or distinction between recommendation or this is a rule. They, you take the recommendation as this is what has to happen. And in fact, they tell the parents, we're doing it because CDH told us that we have to do it even though it's just a recommendation. So uh, I, I think it needs to be removed uh, on the mask issue. Um, we, we need to, to make sure that, that we let parents decide what they, we, like you said in the beginning, we're not telling parents don't do it. We're just telling parents, you decide for yourself. You may wanna put a link, you know, if you wanna, you know, if you wanna see the CDC recommendations here, there, and then they can go, you know, learn for themselves what, what those recommendations. I, I think this board needs to understand that everything that we do at, as a recommendation is seen by the public as this is what has to do, especially the, the policy making bodies within our district. They say, this, if the CDH is recommending it, we're gonna do it. And, and then we're setting policy that I don't think comports with the science. And, mm -hmm. If people want to follow the CDC, that's I, I'm not gonna, I can't do anything about that. But I don't think this board should be setting forth that policy out there. Madam Chair, um, can anybody hear me? Oh, hi, Ryan. Well, hi, sorry. Hey, sorry. Ryan. I'm at a meeting in London. Sorry about that, or just outside London. Um, I agree with Raul. I think, you know, in terms of recommendations, that's exactly what they are. They're just recommendations and we shouldn't be 
forming policy based upon those, especially when the science indicates that there's no indication, you know, especially when the, with the masking issue that uh, it has never worked and never will work for any community respiratory virus in any community setting. So the science is clearly, clearly established that um, the risk benefit, the risks are much higher for these children for emotional, social development, learning development, et cetera. So I'm 100% uh, on board that, unfortunately, people take a recommendation as gospel law, and then they enforce it with detrimental outcomes. And uh, that's my two cents worth on in terms of commentary. So I just wanted to uh, piggyback onto what uh, Raul had said there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, this Yes, I'll I'm, I'm just really concerned. I understand where you guys are coming from because I see how they take recommendations as rules, and, and it's really kind of ridiculous. But what I'm concerned about is us losing our not authority, but our our credentials, our reputation as a as a health organization if we don't have any kind of recommendations for coronavirus. We just take it off the web page. We don't, hey, if you want to know about it, check into CDC. They'll tell you what to do. I don't think that does us the right kind of service, but but I don't know how to get around what you're trying to say, Raul. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I, Madam Chair, sorry. Yes, go ahead. I totally understand what you're saying, but the problem is that we have lost credibility because of the recommendations of forcing kids to mask up. The credibility has already been lost, and I'm trying to gain that credibility. So when do we do have maybe a, a different pandemic that we do re need masking after we look at all or, or whatever we need to do something that this board can be trusted because right now it's not trusted because we're recommending things that are have proven to be ineffective and uh and uh, i just think the board and the community would the community would trust the cdh more if we just stayed out of something that is that it has been proven to be uh, not necessarily effective. Um, and, and again, my, my main concern is, I agree with all of you. If the recommendation was just, hey, this is a recommendation, you guys do whatever you want, but when, when governing bodies in the state of Idaho are using that recommendation as the excuse to set policy, I think we lose credibility at, at, as, as, as a health board because then it's creating conflict that doesn't need to be created. Um, and, and, I think, and I think that's, that's the, the bottom line, is that there's mistrust in government right now. There's mistrust in health boards, which as you guys have all the experiences knew, it, you know, that, that we have that. And, and I think an action like this will actually help you gain trust in the community, because you're not telling people not to. Those who want to can continue to do it. You're just saying it's it's up to you. Silence is a statement. I know it's a statement that you believe in freedom, that you believe in you making a decision for yourself based on on, on whatever you're you're comfortable with. And that's <laughs> interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Is it logical to think that um, by changing some of our wording in there, leaving the recommendations on, but making uh, what CDC recommends uh, that uh, CDH, um, this is not an, an order um, by any means. It is truly a recommendation. You do not have to follow it. It is up to you uh, per district to make your choice. So do we need to clarify our wording on that a little bit? Should we Madam watch? Madam Chair. Did we watch the numbers through this summer and see how they come up by our next meeting? Uh, hi, Megan. Yes, go ahead. Hi, sorry. Sorry, I'm in a meeting in Seattle, so I just stopped out for a minute. But I, I just would kind of offer this comment. Is this more along the line of a situation of you have the link to Central District or to, excuse me, CDC, and then as the situation changes, then you um, you react accordingly. And, and what I was thinking of is like algae bloom, 
there are standards upon which we will then report danger levels on algae blooms, but we don't always have a warning about algae blooms. So I'm just wondering if this is something similar where you can point people to the overall standard and, it's, and they do what they want, but then you give localized releases like and I know it's not the same thing. I was just trying to think of that or like food board illnesses that those kind of standards and their overarching standards that you can point back to and then provide localized advice when that becomes necessary. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, Megan, it does. It kind of goes along with what I was trying to say as far as watching the numbers, what they do this summer. Madam Chair, Dr. Cole, can I uh, throw in another comment? Yes, yes go ahead, Dr. Cole. Uh, my, my concern is if we follow uh, CDC recommendations, we know that the CDC has uh, been publishing false data and withholding data, according to the New York Times article from President's Day, that they've withheld the majority of the data from the American people. If we're making recommendations based on political um, assertions without scientific data, I, I think by even just following a federal agency that isn't following their mandate. I'm at a meeting here with world experts discussing how corrupted the federal literature is, the, peer, the lack of peer review, because there isn't peer review. So making a recommendation that's, uh, you know, political without science behind it, you know, from, from my medical point of view, we need to do exactly what the science is. And the science clearly... Uh, no matter what, we could put everybody in an N95 uh, mask. And even Walensky said, look, when we had Delta, look, the virus is still going to spread. If we masked everybody and gave everybody a shot, it's still going to spread. So, you know, those those are known things. So I think it's almost a moot point that we are even basing any recommendations on CDC policy, uh, which is unfortunate to say as a you know longtime medical scientist of almost three decades. But I, I think we're in this odd uh, scenario in terms of uh, misinformation and disinformation coming from our own federal agencies. And it's very frustrating as a scientist that we're even having to have this argument when there's zero evidence that uh, it's an intervention that does anything whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, Bravo. Madam Chair, on, on this particular issue, you know, I. The, the reality is that all the studies show that there, if there was an, if, uh, any, any kind of benefit, it was negligible, but it, it has had an impact on the children psychologically. We're talking about kids here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about kids that have been affected, that are suffering in their development, they're suffering in the way that they're interacting with each other, they're suffering in the way that they're performing in school. Suicide ideology, uh, ideation has increased. <clears throat> There's a lot of really negative things that are happening because of these masks. And I think following, if people want to follow what the CDC wants them to do, that's okay. I think we should, would be more responsible to remove <coughs> anything from our website that recommend, even recommends these things. But I don't have a problem with it saying, you know, if you want to see CDC recommendations, you know, here's a link. And, if all, and, and then they can be informed as to what the CDC wants. But I do know that it's had a pretty adverse effect on society. I, I have five kids that uh, are now out of the schools. And I, so I've, I've dealt with many of their friends and I've seen it personally, how it's affecting them. Uh, I have a kid right now who just doesn't know what he wants to do with school. He's in college and he doesn't know what, what to do because the last two years have been so difficult in, in the school system. These are kids who graduated at the top of their class and, and even some of my kids are being affected by this. And I can't even imagine the kids that were already struggling in school, uh, what this is doing to them. So we're not talking about things that are not affecting. So the masks have a little bit of benefit and do a lot of damage. And it's damaging our children. It's damaging their future. There's already studies that show that they're at least eight to nine months behind in school because of what happened over the last two years. 
I think it's our responsibility. If we re are really serious about public health, it's our responsibility to remove those things that are affecting our children, not to keep encouraging it. And, and I just, uh, I mean, I understand that we want to do the right thing. And I agree with Al that we, when this started, I thought we were all going to die. I mean, I, I thought that this is, this was, so I understand why people overreacted. And I think it was not unreasonable to overreact at the time because we knew we had no clue what was happening. But now we know what's happening and we specifically know how it's affecting our children. And the, the, the disease does not affect them as much as the reaction. And the reaction has affected them in an adverse way that is good. We're going to feel as a nation and as a state for generations. And I think we need to be more responsible. And I know people disagree with me, but uh, I, I think we need to be more responsible. And we need to stop pushing masks on children. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Megan, go ahead. Just, just to kind of go back to my original comment without, I, I don't, I don't personally have a, 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 an interest in rehashing the whole mask, be mask, vaccine, no vaccine, any of that yet, because we're not in that situation, you know, locally where, where conditions are going to require right this second to revisit it. And, and I think that's, I, I think that we need to do a lot of postmortem on, on how we made the decisions and, and if we did the right thing. But regardless of all of that, surrounding that particular issue, I, I think, it, and this is to concur um, with Raul, is that, you know, putting in the link to the overall organization, I don't know that that's a bad thing. So there's recommendations for the Surgeon General with regard to smoking. There's recommendations from the FDA. There's recommendations from the CDC. And I think having those just recommendations that's fine, have that link. They can make up their mind whether they want to believe that link or the information provided there. But then I think you keep all of the recommendations from Central District Health itself to be situational. And that, that was the point that I was trying to get across. And, and then that becomes more of an overarching policy for how we do business. So that the, the links to some of those organ, the, those entities are available, but we react situationally on a local level. Okay, thank you, Megan. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Al. I think, you know, these guys make a point right now. You know, we all know kids and grandkids that have had the disease have gone through it. And, and it's not as hard on kids, but like you said in the beginning, we didn't know this in the beginning. Nobody knew anything. And so, yeah, we all kind of overreacted, but I would rather overreact and underreact to be on the other side of that. But I think right now we could probably uh, remove this kind of stuff from anything in the website until the situation changed, like Megan says, and then if it blows up again, which it is in other parts of the world right now, and comes back, then we'll have to come back and revisit it. But, you know, to me, I don't want to burn any bridges. I think we still need to keep this in our back pocket if it does, if the virus does come back and get, get hit us again, which is, who knows? Right. We may never have to talk about this again. We hope. <laughs> we hope. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> so, what is, uh, is this a discussion that we can, is this an action item that we could actually table if the board so chooses until August meeting and see what the numbers do? I, I, I would make a motion for us to move the recommendations off our board to attach the link, I mean, off our website uh, to uh, do a link to the CDC and and then we can always come back and we can always also have a, an emergency meeting if, so we don't have to wait till August if something that right happens. <laughs> so that would be my motion to remove all recommendations from our website and attach a link to the CDC recommendations. Oh, also, to wear a mask. What? Recommendations to wear a mask. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. To, to wear a mask. Yeah. <laughs> All of our recommendations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Raul, would you state that again so everybody on um, that's come um, yes, on I, the phone? I will uh, make a motion to move all of our recommendations to wear a mask. Uh, am I saying that right? <laughs> 
Yes, and attach the CDC link to their recommendations. Okay. The motion has been made. Is there a second? I seconded it. Um, any further discussion before we call for a vote by county? Madam Chair, just yes. really quick, this will come off the website. Where else? Is there anything else? Anything that we provide to schools or daycares? Yeah. Thank you. So let me amend the motion. Any, any documentation, uh, whether on the website or uh, in on paper, that goes out from from the CDH until the situation changes, we, we or cannot, unless the situation. Well, we can always. We, that, that's our right uh, is mm -hmm. to come back and, okay. and and we can. I, I think I don't know what the rules are, but. Any member can call for an emergency meeting, right? Yes. Correct. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Change the point. Um, so we'd all have to meet them before we changed anything, right? If we, if the team back, I'm assuming we'd have to get together and declare an emergency and go yeah. like we did. For them to change anything. Yeah. Isn't it? Didn't we pass that before? That before they put it on the website, that we're. Oh yeah, we would all have to meet. Correct. Yeah, yeah. we would have yeah. to be yeah. a board yeah. meeting. Yeah. 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 And then what about educational stuff regarding the virus? You're just talking masks, not about right now. We're just talking about masks, correct? Yeah, for sure. Sign symptoms, whatever. Yeah. So that part will still be on there. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion before I call for a vote? Okay. Hearing none. Jane. Aye. Raul. Aye. Dr. Cole. Aye. Um, Boise County is gone. Uh, yeah. Megan? Aye. Okay, and Valley County? Mr. Hasbrook, aye. Okay, that motion does pass. And moving on, um, we'll turn to Russ Duke again for, uh, I'm sorry. What, what we have a second, second action item there, right? Yeah. yeah. No, you didn't forget anything. We're going to talk about vaccines and kids. I, that's what I was going to yeah. say. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. So this uh, topic to me is different than what we just talked about. And I'm going to explain why. So and, and to start, I understand that individuals have different opinions about vaccine, vaccine effectiveness, but I'm going to tell you how this comes about, and then you can decide, uh, just like you did, did on masking. Uh, to me, the, the policy question, before I get started, is do you want CDH to remain silent on the subject of COVID-19 vaccines for children. And that to me is the decision you have to make. And then depending on your decision, we can talk about that a little bit more. Should we get clear guidance from our, you know, from our clinicians and clinical perspective? Are we gonna reach as far down into operational aspects of CDH or is it just more public? So just keep that in mind. When you say operational, what do you mean? Uh, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. Great question. So, at the operational level, if a patient comes into our clinic, would you prefer our nurse practitioners not recommend to that parent of that 16 year old that they get the COVID vaccine? So to me, they're, they're different, right? You got the, on our website, COVID vaccine, pediatric, here's the schedule versus uh, or if we do clinics out in the community. Do you want us to not offer COVID-19 vaccine, for example. So just, just keep that in mind as far as the, as you think about if you're gonna craft the motion around this, then uh, that, that's something I think you need to just, again, for clarification for us, we know how to implement guidance from the board, but I just wanted to be clear enough that we can. So on COVID-19 vaccines uh, and children, and again, I provided you a, document that uh, in, in our opinion demonstrates that the vaccines do work at reducing the severity now I, granted no question 
I think everybody in the world knows if you're 90 years old with very complex medical conditions, your risks are far greater than a healthy kindergartner. But not all children are healthy. Uh, I don't know what it is now, but about a third of our third graders in Idaho were overweight or obese. So it's like, and, and weight is a risk factor. So let me go into the, how this all plays out. So there's an advisory, advisory committee on immunization practices that's probably the most recognized organization in the world on giving direction as far as vaccines uh, in the United States. So they were established in 1964, which is a long time ago. Uh, and they, all vaccines for children and adults would go to this body and then they have to review all the science and all the data and then they make a recommendation to at basically the Centers for Disease Control and then the director there, if there's politics involved, that's where it would get involved in, in my opinion, uh, whether or not they, they being CDC, adopts those recommendations. So the, com the committee itself is comprised of 15 voting members and 14 of those are have expertise in uh, immunology, pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine, virology, public health, infectious disease, preventive medicine. So these are people who they actually apply for this job. And then there's a nomination process uh, to have them be selected. And then the final say is the secretary of the Department of Human Health, uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, that's who decides who gets on this 15 member body. There is one of those members that they would describe as a con consumer representative. So it's 14 scientists and medical professionals and they rotate off. Um, I can't remember what the, their terms are, two or three years. Uh, and just so you know, if there's the idea that it's politically motivated and, and you know, I don't know, the Department of Health and Human Services certainly is the, the director there, the secretary, but 12 of the 15 were appointed by the Trump administration. Three of those were appointed by the Biden administration. So again, 12 by the Trump administration and three by the Biden administration. So in addition, uh, there's eight ex officio members. And these are the ones that represent federal agencies that probably like FDA and CDC probably has representation on that. Organizations at the federal level that are involved in, in vaccines and vaccine recommendations. Um, but there's also uh, 30 non voting representatives. And these are organizations throughout the United States that work in the, basically the medical field and the disease investigation field. So it's a, it's again, this body I'm talking about and the influence is growing. And uh, someone who has talked to the board in the past, Dr. Christine Hahn, she's the state of Idaho medical director. She's been here for a lot of years. She was a uh, epidemiologist, lead epidemiologist for Idaho before she moved into the medical director position. She's an infectious disease specialist, and she's one of those 30 liaisons, which I think is pretty cool uh, for her to be in that role and representing the Council of State and Territory, Territorial Epidemiologists. So those, those are the folks that review the science and data and, and make a recommendation. So frequency, they meet about three, they meet three times per year. And they do, have, they can have emergency meetings, just like our board, we just talked about that. And then occasionally they do. Um, and probably uh, what, you know, the a question I think about is, so what happens once a recommendation is made in 1972 for XYZ vaccine? Well, they continually review. I mean, these are the people, they're not government people uh, that are, most of them aren't that are on the, uh, true advisory board from a voting perspective. There are people who care about immunizations and care about uh, safety. So bottom line is we're not a set it and forget a policy making board. You know what I mean? They don't set it and all good and whatever happens, happens. Good luck out there. But they do review uh, data. And I was going to mention it like in, it was in 1999, there was a 
uh, rotavirus vaccine called RotaShield, and there was some of you probably remember there was uh, some association between that and, and a type of uh, condition of bowel obstruction in infants. So it got pulled. Uh, the vaccine got pulled. They made a recommendation to CDC to pull that vaccine. Uh, there's other rotavirus vaccines that have been introduced that are effective uh, since then. And there's another one, you know, when you're thinking about the effectiveness of vaccines. So in the 2016-2017 flu season, CDC, um, at the advice of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, said, we recommend that the nasal vaccine not be used. And that was for people up to the age of 50 because they found it to be ineffective. So you got one on a safety, one I give you as an example from a safety perspective, but if you think about effectiveness, uh, they also look at that too. And, and that was adopted by CDC. And, and since then they've revised that. It's a live attenuated uh, virus vaccine uh, and that's being used now, but they did they did make the recommendation to basically withdraw that um, for that for that season. So um, that's what I have for you. I, I do think it's it's clearly well researched. You have this body of individuals who go through an extensive process of application and nomination, and they are the ones who are making the recommendation for the pediatric vaccines based on safety and effectiveness. So with that, um, again, back to the, the decision point or the action item for this board to, to decide today is, do you want CDH to remain silent on the COVID vaccine? That would be websites and information if providers would contact us about the vaccine. Uh, that would probably be that high level. And then the next level is, would you also want to influence the operational level that Raul asked for a little bit earlier. So I'll stop there, answer any questions you have, and uh, you're welcome to discuss it. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Raul, go ahead. So if you could answer, what are we doing right now? So what what is the current state of play? Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. So for all vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines, we follow the recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. So if that's on our website, our vaccine schedule, whether you're talking about varicella vaccine, annual flu vaccine, we recommend and we support both from what we advise the public as well as what we advise our patients. Madam Chair, follow up. Yes, go ahead. So recommend means what? Because I, I do see, I agree with you. I see these two issues as different. And uh, the recommendation of mass then is seen by these entities as where we have to follow it. This is now a personal decision that somebody is making when you, if they see a recommendation, this is a parent making a decision for a child. Uh, when you say recommend, because I have heard some stories that people, that they're being pushed versus recommending. So. What is recommend? Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. So what a recommendation would look like is the a recommended vaccine schedule starting at birth through basically for the pediatric population through 18. We recommended these vaccines and here's the schedule of two doses, one, one month apart. Uh, we certainly would never push you know, a story when you say, you know, if somebody came to our clinic and nurse practitioner is not going to with somebody's arm, a parent's arm to get the vaccine. We'd say, here's what we'd recommend for your child based on their age. And in this case, if, if they weren't already vaccinated, we would recommend the COVID vaccine. So it's, it's not really, you know, it's not like recommended in the schools. You need to get all your kids vaccinated. That doesn't happen. We, simply make a recommendation to follow the advisory committee on immunization practices for all vaccines including covid whether it's in our clinic or a, a provider may co contact us with questions about it like a medical provider uh, we'd say yes it's currently recommended so um, that, i'm sorry go ahead madam chair yes go ahead that's followed then usually by giving the parents a vaccine information sheet so mm -hmm. they read a about it themselves and decide the pros and cons and make a choice. They're not 
the choice isn't made by somebody else. Madam Chair, <laughs> and that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up. It's the VIS statements, the vaccine information statements. So those are handed to prior to vaccine administration by us, by Dr. Young, um, by any medical provider that's administering vaccines, pharmacies. I think they're required. I don't, yeah. maybe mm -hmm. uh, they're, required. they're required. So then you can read through that. Um, has everything from effectiveness to side effects. Uh, so those conversations would take place, but there's no one's, you know, essentially, I think to your question, we're not requiring, uh, and it never will be required in Idaho. So, so another follow-up and maybe a comment. So, so this is where I think there is a concern. I, I'm not anti-vax, all my kids are vaccinated, uh, but I've never had the medical communities demand that my kids get back vaccinated with anything. But in this instance, it's happening where people are being told, if you don't vaccinate your kid with this, you're, you're not a good person. And this is happening in the medical community. It's happening all over. And I see a difference. And you know, you, you gave us this, this emergency use authorization. It's not just, uh, you know, something that is being forced, but it's also something that hasn't been fully approved. It's an emergency use. And we don't know enough about the effects of, uh, of what this is going to have on children. And I worry about it because having five kids that every time I went to the doctor, they gave me that list. They told me, here's read this information. I read it and I chose for my kids to vaccinate them. I never first felt like I was being, you know, shamed into not vaccinating my kids. I just chose for myself and my kids that it was a good idea. Now this is happening, that if you don't vaccinate your kids for COVID with something that hasn't been fully authorized, that you should be shamed, that there's something wrong. So this is, a, again, different concern that I have about masks. This is a concern. I want kid, parents to be fully informed and let them make the decision. I'm hearing, uh, and I know all these things are anecdotal, but of nurses in schools bringing kids in and vaccinating them without getting their parents' permission. And, and things are happening that, that should not be happening. And again, I'm talking about the trust for this body and the trust for government is at an all-time low. And I think, so I want to deal with this in a way that we can increase the trust if if it was just hey here's the information and you decide for your kids i have no problem with that i know maybe some members of the board may have a problem with it but i i don't <laughs> but there's something that's happening that has been politicized and it's almost like you being forced on people and that's what i want to end and i'm trying to figure out what the right solution for that is do, do you understand what i'm saying madam chair yes go ahead i do and that's not you know, that's not something, and I understand it may be limited to COVID vaccine or maybe other providers out there that push other procedures or whatever. And I, I guess I feel like our role is to educate the community on this, the safety and effectiveness of all vaccines, but we can't get to the level of, you know, in my mind, if a school nurse chooses on their own personal philosophy to you know suggest kids should be forced to get this to me that's a that's an issue that the schools need to take up or you know parents if they go to a provider and the provider's pushing it then they can choose to go to a different provider but i i i don't know what how we could influence that because our our recommendation is just pretty standard i mean if we were to stay silent on it it'd be the first time ever in the history of public health and public health department would not um, recommend according to ACIP's recommendations. And, and like you said, the full authorization versus emergency use, it's not like, because I hear people suggest it's experimental use and it's anything but, I mean, it just, it, it fast tracked the steps, which are all described in that article I provided, but it's still um, believed to be safe and effective. And we've been at it for a few but, years, so. Madam Chair. But the, more and more information is coming out about the effectiveness of it. And we, we're hearing about heart issues. We're hearing about other things that, that are at, at a higher rate than other vaccines. 
And, and I think if we're going to, I think those things also need to be presented to the parents. Uh, and I don't know that they are. Um, I, I think there's some questions about this vaccine and, and that are, in my opinion, at least from the stuff that, that's out available, and I'm not talking just about French things, but it's, this is on New York Times, in the New York Times, and in, you know, in, in different types of publications, that there are some issues, especially affecting kids. And then going back to the original thought that the disease itself is affecting kids at a much lower rate than even in some cases the flu. And now we have a vaccine that may be affecting them at a higher rate than the flu vaccine and other kinds of, kinds of vaccines. We, we need to be very careful with what we're recommending. And this is a much more difficult issue because I don't know that I have the right answer. There might be Madam, other people. Yeah. yeah, Madam Chair, Dr. Cole. Yes, um, go ahead, Dr. If anything, uh, we should be recommending against having children be in an experimental trial. There is not an approved vaccine. Uh, it is unethical, according to all medical standards, for any medical professional to ask someone to be in their medical trial without fully informed consent. No one in the world can get fully informed consent because nobody has full ingredients lists on these vaccines. I am literally sitting here with the two world experts on these shots. Omicron is not Wuhan. These shots have not been reformulated and Wuhan is extinct. To recommend this shot, and the ACIP violated all federal regulation and law, and Peter Marks even said, well, even if it's not 50%, we're still going to recommend, which they did for this booster, which violates their federal emergency authorization standards. So even if ACIP recommended it, they violated federal rule and law in doing so. The shot enhances the opportunity now to get disease. It doesn't prevent it. To Raul's point, we don't know the long-term effects. This is an experimental shot, not an approved shot. This is dangerous to our children that survive this virus at 100%. I'm not speaking against other vaccines, just this COVID shot. To recommend it is scientifically wrong and it is dangerous. To his point, one in 2,600 young men in the Hong Kong study had myocarditis. More have it than that because half of myocarditis is silent. We know that the lipid nanoparticle goes to the ovary. We know the synthetic sequence does not break down per Stanford study, Dr. Rolkin's study. This is an experiment on humanity and we do not violate the Nuremberg Code and do this on our children. This is not a vaccine. It doesn't prevent acquisition of disease, carriage of disease, transmission of disease, the disease, or death from the disease in sad cases. It is not a vaccine. It is a poor therapy that decreases symptoms in the earlier variants. It does not in Omicron. In Omicron, it enhances your opportunity to get the disease. It actually narrows the children's immune response and the long-term effect, if another coronavirus comes along, we already know that enhanced reactions, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity is happening in those that have gotten the shots. This is a dangerous gene-based shot that is not a vaccine. We cannot scientifically recommend this to anybody. I, I mean, I am adamant about this. This is the hill I will die on. The children are a no-go with this shot and any additional shot is actually enhancing their chance for risk and adverse outcomes. It does nothing for Omicron in the children other than put them at risk for long-term adverse reactions. That is the science. Sitting here with Dr. Malone, Dr. McCullough, Dr. Gert Vandenbosch and others, I am adamant on this, that not only should we not be recommending it in CDH clinics or in the school or as a board, but from a science and an ethical point of view should be recommending against it because of what it does to the bodies of children. And I will stop there and thank you very much. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. So Dr. Cole, I'm, you know, we're, we're getting pulled both ways here. If you read the second paragraph of this handout, this is recommended by so many different groups, Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy. They are funded by Pfizer. They are funded by Pfizer. Go to their front page, funded by Pfizer. 
if there's any financial conflict of interest and any of these and all of these uh, federal agencies have a financial conflict of interest because the federal government owns the patent on Moderna and then is licensing it uh, uh, to Moderna. The NIH holds the patent and licenses to Moderna. Pfizer is funding all of these medical societies. So when I see a recommendation and there's a financial conflict of interest, then it's not a good recommendation. Go ahead, El. Sorry about that. No, I, that's kind of what I was going to get down to is how can all these people be wrong? But if you're saying they're being influenced because Pfizer's paying their studies or doing whatever, um, that's certainly something to take in consideration. But we've kind of been through this before in the past with a lot of different vaccines over the years. And, and maybe some of them weren't perfect. And certainly this bio, this vaccine is not perfect either. We can see that. But you have to learn somehow that, okay, we got to improve the, the vaccine. It makes them get better. Does that make sense? And we've got to start somewhere. And that's my concern is what I don't want to do is lose credibility with all the other vaccination programs we have. We don't want to want to mess that up either. No, I understand that perfectly. And I think by doing it and then harming children, what happened with the dengue vaccine in the Philippines a couple years ago, they gave the dengue vaccine and a year later when the next uh, variant came along, more children did poorly and they took their vaccine uptake from 88% down to the 30% because all the moms saw the damage done by that vaccine and then they ended up saying, no, we are not going to vaccinate our children with all the other standard childhood vaccines. So in terms of vaccine confidence, and again, I'm only speaking to the, the COVID shots. I'm not speaking to any other vaccine. But to your point, Elt, and it's a great point, um, historically, when a shot has caused adverse reactions the next year, um, it, it decreases vaccine confidence considerably. Madam Chair, I have a recommendation. Yes, Rob. This is a much more complicated issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, would it be appropriate for the board to have a presentation, you know, a longer, you know, and I don't know if, asked if we have to do it as a board meeting, just not, not take any action, just have a presentation from people that support it, people that do not support it, uh, you know, the maybe Dr. Cole can get, you know, somebody to present and just have a longer conversation because we can go on and on about this right. and, and I don't think we're going to come to a conclusion right. today. We can table this to the, this it item, action item today and just get better educated. I, I personally am concerned about the new data that's coming out about it's affecting kids, their hearts. Uh, you know, there's other things that are coming out, and I, I would like to personally have more information before you and I, I make a decision on this. And I don't know what the appropriate way of doing that is. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Thank you. And uh, for myself, personally, I would be in agreement that we get more data, more information. Uh, maybe Dr. Cole can substantiate his, his right. side of the yeah. story. I would with... be happy to do so, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to do so. Uh, later meeting. Does that sound but, reasonable? You know, because this so is too table it? this is too serious to do it wrong either yes, way. It is. Either it way. Is. It is. Now, but my recommendation though is to have us like a just a separate meeting where we're we're not making decisions. An information an meeting. An information meeting so we can learn about it. Uh, um, and, and I don't know what the appropriate way of doing that is. Um, but I at this time I would Make a motion to table this issue till the next um, board meeting, and uh, and recommend that we do some sort of informational meeting so we can learn more about it. This okay. this action item. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? So my question, Madam Chair, is what do we do in the meantime? Do we keep this up or do we take it down? Yeah. So right now, since it's being tabled, it just stays up. I, it stays up. So, I, I have a discussion about that, but we can do that after after the motion. Yeah. So the information is there. It stays up. We do not take a stand on it. Okay. Yeah. So, is there a second, a second to the motion? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion before I call for a vote? Hearing none, Ada County, Dr. Young. Jane Young, aye. Raul Labrador. Aye. Dr. Cole. Aye. 
Uh, Boise County is not here. Megan, are you still there? I think she got on. She got on. Yeah, she's on. Okay. Uh, Valley County? All right. Okay, thank you. That motion does pass. So we'll look forward to the discussion on that. Madam Chair? Yes. I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, the next time it comes up, could we do two separate? Um, I don't even know what you call them. Have these on here or divide up the, if we're going to um, talk to parents or we're recommending it as an agency? Uh, two different. So yeah, two right. Separate Operational versus things. community. Yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And, and just as a discussion item, because uh, I, I, the last thing I want to do is, is interfere with the operational aspect of, of what you guys are doing. Uh, but there, there is a lot of angst in the community about people pushing the vaccines, and I would recommend that whatever you talk when you talk to the staff, that they do it like they've always done it with vaccines. We recommend this. Here's the data, and you make the decision because there, it's almost like a like there's this pressure that everyone has to have this. And I think we give the information and they let parents decide. And I think I never felt pressure when I was with my kids. And I think parents are feeling pressure that they have to do this. Uh, I do recommend also for the that meeting that that the staff look at at the ill effects that this is having. You know, if you're going to give a good presentation on why you recommend that it should happen, you need to also be aware of the, the bad things that are happening because of this vaccine. And I really am concerned about some of the things that Dr. Cole is saying. I'm not quite on board with everything he says, but I it does create a, a lot of concern about the fact that Pfizer is funding all of these studies, the fact that there's a lot of these things that are happening. And I just see this this is being, is being treated different than, than any other vaccines. Then my last item is that any new, this is on a separate issue, any, based on our new policy and on the board, any new recommendation from the CDC before you guys send it out to the community, I think the board needs to, to look at it. Uh, and, and whether it's informally or or formally, I, I don't think we should be surprised by a recommendation on COVID. This is unique that it, you know, that having transmissions in lakes and things like that. I, I think before the CDH sends out a recommendation to the community, I think the board needs to be made aware that this is something you guys are discussing and aren't thinking about. Anyway, I will finish. I will end with that. So, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Um, the, uh, I guess as far as the follow-up, just thinking about the timing on this, Dr. Cole has, um, sounds like extensive literature on the science-based reputable journals to provide to us. So, so Dr. Cole, if you could provide that to me, and I'll, I'll pass it on to the board. I think that'd be the, the best way. Do you have a, a timeline on that, Dr. Cole, that you could provide that? Probably midweek. I'm in uh, England for three days, then I'm home for two days, then I'm in Florida and then Texas. But I will um, I will aggregate the data. I have multiple sources. I have multiple links. And okay. I have the world experts sitting here with me. I'll get their papers as well. And I will forward those to you, Russ. Yeah, that would be great. So you, you all should expect that by the end of next week. It sounds like midweek I'll get it. Oh, some late night reading. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. I'll, I'll try to do some summary points and make it, you know, basic science. So you don't have to read uh, 150 papers, but it, I'll, I'll hit like the 12 bullet points as to why and then link all the references to those. Madam Chair, oh. just, just a question yes, for Dr. Yes, Brian, do you got do you have any information too on just the natural immunity of the disease itself? 150 papers on natural immunity, and it's 13 to 30 times stronger than vaccinal um, immunity, and uh, that's data out of Israel and data out of Qatar. And I do have 150 papers on that. Thank you. You I bet. Think we're kind of at a situation where we've got a vaccine that maybe is not real great. To start, so maybe we don't want to necessarily recommend it right now. Maybe we need to wait and see what else is developed and, and from the lessons learned from the old vaccine. I don't know, but um, I just want to make sure that we protect 
all the other vaccination programs that we do have going because those are, right. those are super important. Um, yes. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Russ, I'm going to have you uh, lead the discussion on staff bonuses. Sure. So, uh, as I have been sharing, and as is going on broadly in our community, not just at CDH, is we have lost a lot of staff. Uh, I know Representative Blanksma kind of brought this up at the last meeting. Is would is is uh, salaries and other incentives are they effective? And you know, I I don't know. I, I know a lot of our staff are leaving, <laughs> yeah. and they're getting more money. Uh, we do exit interviews, offer exit interviews for all our staff. They're uh, not necessarily, in fact, I, I don't recall Gary sharing with me that somebody left because, well, I think that's a, there is an exception recently. One, one of our environmental health specialists left to go to District 3, same job, same experience, and getting paid quite a bit more per hour. So that's the one exception. I, I uh, So... So we have, and I, you know, the idea is, well, what what can we do in, in looking at salaries and trying that as a as a tool? We know the cost of living has gone up dramatically. I didn't see the article, but apparently Boise is the most unaffordable city in the United States now. So, um, you know, we've gone from where we were ten years ago, a fairly well, even then we were number one for lots of things, and that's probably why our population's grown so much among other other reasons so here's what i'd like to do uh last meeting i said we were going to give a temporary merit increase the board the board said in particular uh, representative blanks was suggested come back with a bonus proposal so so the i think what makes bonuses pretty attractive other than name bonus for government employees is that that they uh tend to provide some reward maybe help with gas bills or uh, grocery bills in a fairly short-term nature. It's not an ongoing liability to CDH. And lastly, we have the money to do it because this year, like last year, COVID funding allowed us to re reduce the amount of district dollars we were spending. That's not money we get to keep forever, right, as far as the revenue coming in. So what I'd like to do for retention purposes, and I want to emphasize that this is a retention bonus. It's not performance-based in any way and my proposal will reflect that so new employees if you began employment in uh this year basically since january 1 i'm recommending we do a 750 dollar bonus if you began employment during calendar year 2021 last year it'd be 1500 dollars, and then if you began employment prior to calendar year 21 it's two thousand dollars and that's what I would request your approval, and I would like to implement that effective basically immediately. It'll uh, appear in the uh, first paycheck in June for our staff if you approve that, along with the raises that were approved previously, uh, cost of living and merit-based raises, they would go into effect at the same time. Okay, the, the 2K was what date? Basically, if you were hired, um, Prior, prior to calendar year 21. Okay. Madam Chair, just, yes, go ahead. Just a clarification. That's a one-time bonus, correct? So 2K, two K, two two K one time. Are you paying that over a period of time or one time? Madam Chair. Yes. So it will be paid out one time. So okay. it'll appear. I think it's June 10th. If I got the date right, in a June 10th paycheck for our staff. The taxes will be taken out, of course. Okay. So. I think that's a great start. Yeah. We really do at least we'll retain some folks, but I think we still have an issue of getting ooh, folks to apply. Yes. Is that a rock that just took the window? I think so. Door? I think that was a rock. I'm glad it didn't hit the, the, yeah. the door, actually. <laughs> you feel it in the back of your head? <laughs> it's a big lawn. He's been out there for two hours. And he's taking his time, too. Yeah. I was going to see if he wanted to trade places. <laughs> 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 okay, any further discussion on the bonuses, staff bonuses? <clears throat> well, and I think that the difficulty is this is what happens next year. Because mm -hmm. that, and we can certainly offer them again next year, just everything moves up another calendar year and go that direction. 
but I think it's important for employees to know that this may not happen again next year as well. Madam Chair, That's right. could they get half of it now and then half of it six months? So you get six months of them thinking positively about the environment and see if you, you know, it's like if you have the party on Monday, you get to enjoy it all week. If you have the party on Friday, it's done. It's like having two birthdays a year. It's a really yeah, fun idea. Birthday, yeah. So yes, Madam Chair, I, I actually, I think for all the reasons that we've been talking about how you're maybe losing staff, although I don't think it's necessarily losing salary. I have a business where we have a starting salary of 50 bucks an hour, no experience, and I can't get some anybody to even apply. So I don't think it's just salaries that are costing our issues, but I think it's a good reward for them to, you know, they've worked pretty hard and and I know the cost of living is going up and you know I'm pretty good fiscal hawk on things, but I, I, I would be fine with just doing it all in, <laughs> up front. So. I, I feel like we should do it all at once, too, yeah. because they have, they're incurring the expenses now. Right. The gas is going up, all that stuff. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> I know. We just got notified at the county that our medical insurance is going to go up almost 10% this yeah. year, premium, which is about what? A three percent raise would be for everybody in the facility. So you'll get your medical insurance, but you may not get a raise. That's yeah. tough. That's enough, huh? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to that effect? Madam Chair, I'll make yes. that motion that we authorize the uh, bonuses for staff as initiated by our district director. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Prior to a vote. Does that include board members? <laughs> We're still no. We're still no. <laughs> this is almost volunteer. Yeah. Volunteer. Yeah. Okay, calling for a vote by County Starting with Dr. Young. Jane Young. Bell Labrador. Aye. Dr. Paul. Aye. Uh, Aye. The county's not representing. Megan's gone. Um, Valde County. Uh, Commissioner Hasbrook. Aye. Okay, thank you. That motion does pass. And I just want to thank you for approving that. I know, as you mentioned, Ro, is it money? Is it, we're just in a really, we just don't know. Don't know, and it's a difficult time. Just, just you know, with the cost of living, groceries, gas, housing, rent, unavailability of housing, like complete unavailability of housing. And uh, yeah, we've been advertising for six months and we can't get, we're losing business because we don't have. Uh, yeah, crazy. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. And staff will really support it. We'll be appreciative of it. Madam Chair, I have an yes. issue. I, I actually have to go catch a plane. But if I leave, will we lose the more? Um, we're, we're done. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll wait. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe Russ can be uh, brief in his right. director's report. I will be. So um, the Idaho Association of Local Boards of Health, just a reminder, we're the host. It's going to be virtual, but you all are welcome to come to our Boise office for that. So all the boards will be meeting with us uh, at that time, but, but it'd be good to have you there. I think the meeting goes smoother and easier. What day is that? Other. June 9th. June 9th, 1.30. Mm, at 1.30. And it's, I have a dilemma because we have an IEC conference that I can't make that one either. Oh, <laughs> everything's starting to pile up here. And then I was going to ask you, I know this is probably part of your discussion, but we may need to have someone else attend that for me. I, I, I will be there, but yeah. um, I'm going to be okay. okay. But, so point being glad you brought it up uh, <laughs> yes, is you proxies. do have proxies so probably the the biggest uh, conversation or decision points are around like the iab budget budgeted for next year we'll likely get together next year i think the meeting's going to be in Coeur d'Alene uh and and the resolution so if you're not planning to be there and, and dr kolak i I know you have this uh, document that Donna would have provided, but I just want to call that your attention to that. If if you want somebody 
from the CDH board to vote on your behalf, uh, make sure you got, you fill out the proxy and, and give that to me. And I guess you got to make sure they're going to be there. So Betty Ann will be there if you want to give her the okay. proxy. Thank you, Russ. We'll do. Yeah, for sure. And you could, you just, I know you're busy and traveling, just sign it, scan it, and send it to me. And uh, we'll make sure your vote's represented. And I do think it's important. Sometimes we don't have proxies in our topics where, you know, we have three people vote compared to 48 or 49 board members. I like to make sure we have our influence. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really important yeah. that everybody has at least a proxy because yes. they do count. Okay. So we all know. Get them to me. Or Donna, or both. Um, the salvo, we had that salvo, nalvo discussion. Do we want to continue? El uh, chaired the meeting, and it was unanimous that all the public health districts, this is not telling them to not be members of the National Association of Local Boards of Health as individual boards, but not to participate in this state association group of NALBO. So we're not going to have a representative anymore and we're not participating anymore. Per the uh, Executive Council's recommendation, it's just a recommendation. The IAB body on June 9th will vote on that. Okay, last item, and this relates to the uh, agenda item number six. So there are strategies used for retention by the private sector where you essentially uh, set aside funding for the future, you let staff know you're going to get it, but you got to be here when that date comes to get the money. So um, I'm going to present this to you in August just for consideration, but just real high level what that would look like is uh, using one-time funding, using carryover money, and that's when we talk about carryover money in August, is to put that money in a designated account for the purpose of the staff getting that retention incentive, let's say in December around holiday time or January when the bills start rolling in. And, and you ladder that as long as there's funding for it uh, into the future. So, and that would always, uh, uh, every time we would fund that, it would be based on the board's approval to do that as well as the dollar amount and pending funding. So I just wanted to plant the seed. Like I said, I know it's a strategy. Um, you know, hey, you know, Dr. Young, you're getting $1,500 based on you're here, but you're not getting it till December. So if you leave, you're leaving that money on the table and, and then you ladder that into the future. Okay. So, so I wrote he quits in January. <laughs> so, uh, so that, that, um, Where's Donna? Donna's behind the Donna's secret curtain. Behind. So, is there anything I missed? Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Okay, all right. Well, well that's that... lunch. Oh, good point. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our agenda for today. Uh, I want to thank Boise County for uh, hosting us, as well as the public who. Um, participated in our meeting today remotely. And at this time, um, I will announce we do have an August 19th meeting, uh, 8.30 a.m. And on that note, I will call for a motion for adjournment. Yes, I'll move. Okay. So moved. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, vote by county, starting with Jane for adjournment. Uh, I, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, Raul Labrador. I am a doctor. Doctor Cole, aye. Okay, Boise County, Elmore County, uh, Valley County, aye. and Elmore County votes aye. So thank you, folks, and have a wonderful weekend. So thank you, again, everybody. Thanks, Doctor Cole. Um, Donna just mentioned it, and I don't know—is there?